Uh, my name is Dwayne Beck. I manage the Dakota Lakes Research Farm at, at Pierce, South Dakota. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit of a history of what we do there. In the area around us, we're about 90, 98% uh, no-till farmers now. I have myself have not done tillage since uh, the mid-1980s. So if you <clears throat> have trepidation about whether the system works, it works. I've seen it work all over North and South America and much of Europe and Ukraine. So uh, it's really not that difficult a system if you start thinking differently about what you're doing. So. The native vegetation where I'm from is different than yours. So I'm not going to give you recipes on how you should farm. It's a principle, how you fit into what Mother Nature wants you to do. Uh, this is what our landscape looks like. The only place we have trees is where there's major drainage ways. And that's because we don't have enough moisture to have trees. The research farm. Uh, it's located right along the Missouri River. Uh, you can see there on the bottom there, we have both dry land and irrigated ground, and we have another property uh, that's about four miles north of there that's very heavy clays. We're at 44 degrees latitude, so we're south of you quite a ways, but we're a continental climate, so it's much colder in the winter and much hotter in the summer. So we'll go from minus 40 to plus 40. It's not normal to be minus 40, but it's normal to be minus 27 uh, Celsius. Uh, latitude, uh, that's latitude, longitude is 100 degrees west, so it's a long ways away. Uh, the earlier explorer, explorers said that the, there was nothing could grow west of 100 degrees latitude because it was all too dry. And the, the explorers in Canada made the same, same prediction that you couldn't grow anything in Western Canada, and all the grain now comes out of Western Canada. We're at 500 meter elevation, mean precipitation is 474 millimeters. Most of that occurs in uh, March, April, May, and June. We have a very typical continental climate, so cold, dry winter, uh, hot, dry summer. There is a kind of a pointer where we're at. We're halfway between uh, Minneapolis and Denver. If you want to try to see some, or think of some things that are associated with South Dakota, Mount Rushmore is there. Dances with Wolves, if you're old enough, was filmed there. In fact, some of that was filmed within two miles of the research farm. And uh, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally happens there. And then, and somebody reminded me that Little House on the Prairie was from there. So some people do. I actually know it from Laura Ingalls Wilder book, so she was a native of South Dakota. Fires in California, fires in Brazil, fires in Australia, fires on the Great Plains, floods in California, floods in the Corn Belt, floods at, at Yellowstone National Park, floods in Australia, and tornadoes in December. Aquifers, aquifers are overappropriated, so California has no water. Lakes, rivers, and oceans are degraded. The number and extent of hypoxic zones in the world's oceans have doubled every decade since 1960. We have a problem. We, as humanity, have a problem. The things, a lot, a lot of things talked about at this conference were little incremental things. This is a big thing, big thing that we have to deal with. This is similar, but much worse. In 1898, when Sir William Crooks addressed the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Bristol, how many people know him? Never heard of him. <laughs> he is very famous. He made the Crooks tube, which led to the, to the vacuum tube, invention of the vacuum tube. Very famous guy. His message that day was that the UK and all advanced civilizations were going to starve due to lack of N fertilizer. That they were going to starve within 50 or 60 years. Because the Guano Islands had been exhausted, the, the Chilean desert nitrates were gone. We couldn't feed all the people we have because we didn't have enough nitrogen fertilizer. 
this is worse. The development of the Haber-Bosch process provided a temporary solution. We make nitrogen from fossil fuels. But that's going to go away, too, because we can't afford to do that anymore. We have to find something different. What are we going to do? And, and as every woman knows, this is bad enough that even a man would have to ask for direction. Okay? Well, we can't figure out where we're going unless we're, we know where we've been. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to see how we got here. Humans appeared in the current form approximately 200,000 years ago. We didn't begin to do domesticated plants and animals until 11,000 years ago. And in the Western Hemisphere, they never had animals for beasts of burdens or domesticated livestock because it wasn't anything suitable. The American bison, or the thing you call a buffalo, is just not a real good domestic animal. Uh, he, <laughs> you could, we can do it now, but he's, he's, not, he's not something you'd train to drive. All energy 11,000 years ago was human labor or animal power. The Western Hemisphere, as I said, was most, we had no animal power. A human can exert 1 20th of a horsepower, an oxen a half a horsepower. Early farming systems were often polycultures, especially in the Western Hemisphere. So they did the three sisters, for instance, the Native American. If or when negative feedbacks occurred and the land degraded, they just moved on. That was a normal protocol in the early days because they didn't have permanent settlements. When civilization became more, less mobile, started building cities, <clears throat> there was increased demand on the land and degradation got worse. The products produced by sunlight were used as the only source, really, as food, feed, and fuel. They didn't have any other way, any other source of fuel and such. Progress was limited because there was not enough energy to both produce the food and have energy for transportation. Empires like the Romans, the Romans were here. Why did they come here? They were looking for more land to increase their food production, and they, and they used slaves. So that's how they were getting more things to send back to Rome. Several centers of in, empire building by European and Asian countries occurred between Roman times and the Industrial Revolution. In all cases, the goal was to increase the quantities of food, fuel, and feed to support progress by increasing the land area that they were degrading and harvesting from. Seven years ago, my wife and I came here and did a meeting uh, during the winter, and then we went through France and did a series of meetings. And when we were in France, they always took us to their castles. Every city has a little castle. And I would ask them where they produced the food that supported all that effort to build the castle and, and the, the grain that they would put in the granaries. And they said, well, from the land around the castle. And so when you looked at what they had left, it looked like that, all degraded. So what do you do once you've degraded your land around that castle? Uh, <clears throat> why did that happen? Well, circular biological systems, natural systems are circular. The nutrients go back where they came from. They were being replaced by linear systems focused on extracting resources. The speed of degradation was initially limited due to the lack of energy for, for transporting the resources. In the Western Hemisphere, the Aztec, Inca, Mayan, uh, Missouri, and all those wonderful cultures that build these big cities. If you haven't been to Machu Picchu or to Hodokan or something, if you ever get to the Western Hemisphere, it's worth going to. These massive, complex cities were all built with no-till, but their limitation was they couldn't transport stuff very far. If you took a, if we're going to transport corn to sell it to somebody, you'd take a backpack on your back and 
start trudging off to sell it, you can only go so far before you'd used up more energy than what you were transporting. This changed abruptly and right very close to here with the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s. Development of coal and other fossil energy meant that the lack of energy was less of a limiting factor. Fossil fuel was the engine for that Industrial Revolution, especially in the UK, but also elsewhere. They produced steel. Steel let them do railroads. Railroads let them do a better job of hauling. They couldn't even utilize the coal very well unless they had steel rails to take the coal to the cities. Producing 2.3 million tons of steel annually with wood or coke, uh, that 2.3 million tons is what was produced in Britain in 1850, would have required cutting a forest of 97,000 square miles every year. That is greater than the total surface area of the country. <laughs> so, wow, that's an interesting number, isn't it? Use of fossil fuels has allowed society to ignore the feedback loops and constraints that would tend to limit degradation. We've, we're drunk on fossil fuels. It's made us stupid. Uh, transportation system made it possible to increase the speed and extent of extraction of the resource. Transportation system made it possible to operate linear systems. Exploration and, ex and out-migration was the answer was a consequence, because we couldn't do enough here, so let's go somewhere else. So where did you go? Yeah, North America, South America, right? So in 1743, the French explorers, the Lavandre brothers, came through my home territory right on the Missouri River looking for beavers and also for a road or a river that went west to the Pacific Ocean. They buried a lead plate in 1743 on, on top of a hill there, claiming that area for France. That's kind of an important part. Uh, they were looking for beavers. You guys in your hats, you needed to have beavers. So they were, they were coming there to get beavers. If you went to the movie The Revenant, that's a true story. The guy that got mauled by the bear. Uh, the, he was trapping beavers. That's a true story. There's no trees where he was. So that whole movie is a bunch of crap because there was no trees. That whole movie is full of trees. I'll, I'll take you there someday. You'll have a hell of a time finding a tree between where he was mauled and where the fort was. So we had a colony. You had a colony in the eastern part of the United States. It became a, a country. And in 1796, George Washington, the first president, was conversing with uh, Thomas Jefferson, and they were both farmers, saying, we need to do a better job of taking care of the land in the eastern seaboard or we'll be forced to go somewhere else and move further west. 1796. Seven years later, we bought the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon. Napoleon had claimed this whole area between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains, that whole center third of the United States. The United States bought it because Napoleon, who was planning on putting slaves there and just producing food there, he experienced in Haiti a rebellion of the slaves that killed a whole bunch of his soldiers. So he decided maybe that wasn't a good idea and just sold the place, right? And we bought it, the United States bought it, and they sent two, two uh, explorers, about 20 men in total, up the Missouri River all the way from St. Louis, up the Missouri River through North and South Dakota, Montana, across the mountains, and all the way to Oregon, and then back. They lost one man in doing that. And <clears throat> so they came right by us. This is the middle part of South Dakota. We're right along the Missouri River. They came right across our property. This is what it looks like now. We've restored the native vegetation to pretty close what their journals said it was there. What I did is went and read their journals and tried to figure out what was there. Uh, that's what it looks like when, when things are good. That's big blue stem and little blue stem and, and Maximilian sunflowers. It's, it's kind of pretty. 
Uh, the water in the back is not the river, it's a lake. They put in reservoirs, and that would have been all treed when they came through. Native American com communities in central South Dakota, before the introduction of the horse, were farmers. If you were a hunter-gatherer and didn't have a horse, you are going to starve to death. Uh, so they grew corn, sunflowers, beans, and, and squash. Lewis and Clark ex Expedition actually per, uh, purchased corn from the Native Americans in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bismarck's where Gabe Brown is from, if you heard of him. Uh, <clears throat> so they had very successful farms there uh, before the white man came. So the white man brought a horse, but it also, he also brought uh, smallpox and measles that almost wiped out all the Native Americans. When the animals were removed and replaced by tillage, by white men came in, settled there, when the animals were removed and replaced by tillage-based farming and overgrazing by domestic livestock, uh, severe degradation occurred and occurred very quickly. How long did it take? There was less than 50 years between statehood and the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. How many people have read the book Dirt? The cover of that book was taken, the picture on the cover of the book was taken in South Dakota. And if you read Dirt, you should then read uh, Growing a Revolution, because I've asked David Montgomery to come back and look at that after we changed it a bit. Degraded soils and no beavers resulted in dust storms and crop failures. At the same time, there was severe flooding. So you had really dry conditions on the land and flooding on the river because the water cycle was broken. The natural water cycle, we have to try to maintain that. If we don't, it's never going to work. What's a white European man's response to something like this? because that's what we are, build dams. Don't try to fix the ecosystem, build a dam. That's got to work. So they built four large main stem reservoirs on the northern parts of the Missouri River. That's one of them you saw in the background. And they were going to irrigate a half a million acres of, of land with that, because obviously we're too dry to grow anything. So they put on irrigators, and as soon as they applied the water at the land, it ran off and went right back to the river. <laughs> the water cycle's still broken, you dummy. You know? This, and this is about the time we entered because the farmers were needing, I was just a young graduate student, but they were needing help getting water to go in the ground better. The, <clears throat> they were treating the symptom instead of addressing the cause. We needed, to, we needed to really do something different with that. Well, who or what is responsible for us getting to this point? And we didn't know. That's one of the things you hear a lot of time. Well, geez, I didn't know. Uh, well, there's Plowman's Folly, 1930s vintage. Conquest of the land by Loudermilk, 1930s, 19, early 1940s. The Worst Hard Times by Egan in the 40s. Dirt by Montgomery. Civilization Critical by Darren Qualman is more recent. If you haven't read that, you should. It's a bit depressing. We, we did know, and we do know, nobody here will deny that we just got a mess. Our systems, our ecosystem is not working well in a lot of cases in agriculture. Uh, little tiny changes are probably not going to fix that. We just don't want to change. I mean, that's the biggest hindrance. They had to listen to the politicians all day today. And we're going to give you money for that, and we're going to give you money for that. And we're going to give you what they need is a brain transplant, right? They <laughs> just a different way of thinking about things. Present govern government, economic, and social systems favor degradation over regeneration. Everything's about gross domestic product and exports. Let's go, guys. But nobody's looking at the ecosystem. The total United States government subsidy for crop insurance was 2000, in 2013 was $14 billion just to subsidize crop insurance. Total federal budget for agricultural research was $2.6 billion. What kind of priority is that? 
give them subsidy and don't do the research. Okay? Now, notice that year, 2014. That was when we were talking subsidized health insurance. So I showed this set of slides to a group of farmers in Kansas that know what till in the plains is, well, if you think you need subsidized crop insurance, then subsidized health insurance must be a good thing also. You can have it both ways. And of course, they were adamantly against subsidized health insurance. Total direct subsidy for agriculture in 2019 was $22 billion in addition to the crop insurance subsidies. Totally ridiculous. So where are we going? Obviously, we need a different model for ag research and policy development. Because it's coming from politicians, and it's coming from industry, and you've got lobbyists and whatever, but the farmers aren't driving the bus. You sit here and yell at the politicians and whatever, but you gotta get in, you gotta get in the, and drive the bus. So when these farmers came and thought we needed to do something about runoff, we did some things within the little bit of resource I had. And it was quite successful. They said, we need to do more of this, and let's go to the government and get a piece of property so you can have a research farm. And I said, you don't want to do that. Because if you do that, you have a whole bunch of little tiny small plots. But nobody will really be looking at the big picture. I said, let's raise the money to buy the farm and then work with the university to run the research. Because in the US, the universities run the research. We got that done. It took about 10 or 12 years. But it's owned and directed by farmers. I have a board of directors that I work with. I've retired now. I've got a, we've got a new manager, but I'm still involved. All the fixed facilities are owned by the farmers. And irrigation equipment is owned by the farmers. We have an 11-member board of directors that are all farmers. They managed to call a, a board meeting the other night when it's 1 o'clock in the morning here. I got, I got to teach them how to do the clock thing better. <laughs> and, the, and the research manager works with the board of directors and the university and the researchers to tie this all together because the researchers are important to do the incremental work. I asked a wheat breeder one time that I wanted a black strawed wheat. And he goes, why? <laughs> well, you have trouble with the soils warming up in the spring if your soils are light colored because it reflects the sunlight. And if I could plant certain rows of my wheat to black strawed wheat, then I could plant the corn there and I wouldn't have to worry about the corn emerging, but the weeds, the the weed in between would be light straw and to keep the weeds from growing. He couldn't pull it off, but that's one of the kind of things, the goofy things, you can do if you have systems people working with component people. So there we'll see that again. Our big influence is on this central part of the state. Actually, it goes way further than that, but I can claim this area. This is the stuff we know we've influenced. That's about 200 kilometers east to west and 400 kilometers north to south. In the period between 1986 and 2014, uh, we just calculated how much the crop production had changed. 1986, there wasn't any no-till. 2014, we were probably at 80 percent. We're now up around 98. The difference between those two, if we took the price in 2015, which is lower than the, what the price is today, the difference in production per year was $1.6 billion. Huge. Huge difference. The big thing is we have, we have new grain bins, we have new houses, we have farmers driving John Deere tractors, for God's sake. You don't buy a John Deere tractor until you have more money and you know what to do with it. And <clears throat> And you certainly don't build a house until you, you just, you go, God, I don't have anything more than I want to buy. And your wife says, uh, hello, think of me, let's build a new house. Okay? But it's, the big thing to me is that the small communities that had almost disappeared are coming back. So we're, we've got 
Well, I taught high school at one time in my ancient past, and we had two sections in a small town. We had two sections of every grade in elementary school. They got to, down to one section and got down almost to the point where they were going to close the school. Now they have two sections through sixth grade again. It's starting to come up from the bottom. This success was not achieved because we set out to improve yields. It didn't do that. We wanted to do a better job of managing the ecosystem. So the dirt was blowing. You used to close the roads. When I taught school, they'd close the roads in the wintertime for blowing dirt. Better manage these ecosystem process and look at natural systems. I did not know how to no-till. I knew that we had to quit doing tillage. But Mother Nature's never done tillage. So I knew that we could emulate, look at what the native prairie did and try to mimic what happened there. Now, unfortunately, all the progress we've made so far is just doing the wrong thing better. We're still exporting a lot of our products. Our corn goes to ethanol, the distiller's grain goes away, the soybeans go to China. We've got to push that up the ladder a ways. If I export only the oil, from the soybeans, and if I press, and you'll see later, we press our beans. If I export only the oil, the only thing that's left the farm is sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. There's no minerals in the oil. Mother Nature will bring you back the carbon dioxide, the sunlight, and the water. So you've closed the system some. The light bulb was not invented by incrementally making candles better, right? Ag research, they keep incrementally trying to make things better. Just go, no, we got to do something different. No-till is not a goal. It's a tool. But you, can't, you cannot manage agricultural ecosystem if you do tillage. And I, I ran into that here a few places. They're going, oh, well, you're using this and this, and that's bad on on the soil biology. The worst thing on soil biology is a tillage tool. It absolutely is a catastrophic event. Doesn't happen. Mother Nature doesn't do tillage. So it's a start when you do no-till. And then you've got to add all these things in there to do diversity and such. So we want to, the, the definition of regenerative agriculture, which we've used for over 20 years, my definition of regenerative agriculture is we mimic the wa natural water cycle. What happened here before man come in and start cutting down the trees and whatever, what, what happened here in terms of the water? What happened in terms of the energy flow, the catch, catching of energy and cycling it? What happened in terms of mineral cycle? And what happened in terms of, of uh, community dynamics? I asked John the other day, where are you going to put your walnut trees. And he looked at me goofy. Well, they're English walnuts, right? Don't you own walnuts? Aren't they from here? So why aren't you growing any? Because they grow them in California. They don't have water in California. Maybe you're going to grow some walnuts again. And that fixes some of the water cycle issues you have here. Does the rain feed plants and recharge groundwater? Does it run off or deep percolate and cause erosion and water quality degradation? Does it go out drain tile? If it goes out drain tile, it ends up in the ocean and your nutrients go with it. Why do you want your fertilizer in that, those people's ocean? <laughs> you shouldn't want that. Remember that picture of the runoff? Can't have that happen. We now will put on, this is our irrigators right now. One of them blew over the other night. Uh, you can see in the background what it looks like. Uh, it's just kind of rolling prairie. We now put on t two inches or five centimeters of water in nine minutes. And no runoff. And if you come and visit in the summer, we'll walk behind those irrigators and you won't get your feet muddy. And there's, we're a few people in the room that's been to my house. So they've seen that. No-till is not about lack of tillage, but about manage your soil water, the soil structure, the soil biology, and carbon compounds in the soil. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Ecosystems harvest sunlight energy to drive all the other processes. If you remove the products, 
that energy from the ecosystem, it reduces the energy available for the biology. So you gotta be careful about not removing too much stuff. Is the energy that you use on your farming system constant or finite? Is it benign or potentially damaging? Is it internal or external? What do I mean by that? Sunlight comes up in the morning and it's constant. We know it's going to come up. If the sun doesn't come up, we're all screwed. We just, that's it. We're just, you have to get out the wine, let's have a party. Uh, <clears throat> fossil fuels are finite. Sunlight is somewhat benign. There's some people running around here with pretty bad sunburns they didn't put on their, didn't put on their sun, sunscreen, so it's not benign to them, but it's pretty much benign. The, the, the fossil fuels are damaging. No potentially about it. Sunlight's internal. If you, if you own the land or rent the land, you get that for free. Fossil fuels are external. 80% of the total input costs in agriculture can be traced directly to energy at the present time. Think about that, 80%. Yeah, everybody's, it sucks. We've got all this 80% and the price of fuel goes up. And all the politicians, oh, we're going to drill some more and we're going to reduce the taxes. But no, let's quit using the damn stuff. That's easy. Fossil fuel input in agriculture 140 years ago was zero. In less than 100 years, it's going to have to be zero again and more maybe like 40 or 50. Why? In 1970, the average price of wheat was $51 a ton. The average price of barrel oil was $3.39. What's it today? What's that ratio today? You're using, you're producing products, 80% of your costs are related to a, a commodity that's going way up in price, and your price of your commodity is going down relative to that. In Minnesota, where tillage is king, it takes slightly under 100 liters of diesel fuel per hectare for tillage, seeding, and harvest. It takes approximately 250 liters of diesel fuel to produce 150 kilograms of nitrogen using the Haber-Bosch process. If the Minnesota farmer applies 150 kilograms of N per hectare, the energy involved in nitrogen is much more than his energy for tillage, even for conventional tillage. It's just a silly thing. And I don't think we can totally throw the N out. The biological N fixation just is not large enough to meet all of our needs right now. Use, <laughs> use of inorganic nitrogen fertilizer was essentially zero prior to 1950, but we weren't as productive as we are now. It was 100 million metric tons in 2010. That's probably too much. We can do better with it, but we may still need to use it for quite a while. The Dakota Lakes Research Farm will be fossil fuel neutral by 2026. That's easy for me to say, I retired. <laughs> go, okay, Sam, here you go. We're, build, we're building our, our solar power system this summer. We've got, the, we've got the building all super insulated, all that's done. We've got an electric pickup ordered. We're gonna get two or three electric ATVs, okay? We do not have a choice. We have to get rid of the fossil fuels. And that's one of the things we do. We just dive in and figure out what problems we're going to have trying to do that. We press all of our own oil seeds. A, 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 a hectare of uh, canola will produce about 200 and something gallons of, I mean, uh, liters of fuel or more. It's really not a big deal. Total energy use, this is one of the big ones. Total energy use on Earth in 2012 was 560 exajoules. <laughs> what the hell is an exajoule? Uh, 1.6 by 10 to the 13th kilowatt hours. Total energy in use that year. Fossil fuels, biological energy, whole use of energy for a year. 86% of that non-food energy that was used that year was fossil fuels. 
Estimates of the total sol solar energy at the Earth's surface range from uh, 1,600 to 40,000 exajoules per day. Per day. Okay? That means one day of sunlight is four to 800 times as much as the energy that was used in a whole year. What's the problem? I mean, what the hell? Why are we buying fossil fuel? We've got plenty of fuel. We're going to use energy. That's what we do. The mineral cycles are the nutrients available for plant use or environmental services, or have they been leached, eroded, or transported from the landscape, sent to China or the ocean? Okay? Even if you ship it from here, 80 kilometers, 100 kilometers that way, what happens to it? It doesn't get back. The big one is leaking nutrients through the through drain tiles and that kind of stuff and into saline seeps. Ecosystems that leak nutrients turn into deserts. That's the definition of desertification, is loss of nutrients in the soil. A 120-car train of soybeans contains 250,000 kilograms of phosphate. That's scary. Even if it doesn't go on the train, if it goes down to your chalk and moves sideways and comes out down in the valley, you've lost it, and you've caused a problem down there. You need to cycle it. And you use things with like deep-rooted crops like trees in wet environments to cycle your nutrients. A reduction in pH or organic matter and fertility are symptoms of poor nutrient management and water cycle management. So we need to rethink all aspects of agriculture and society. It's way deeper than what the, the, they were talking about today. It's a way bigger thing. Trying to export more, more products to make money is probably not the answer, unless we go way up the chain. And we should be not shipping soybeans to China. We should be shipping pigs, pork. When you, when you ship pork, you ship very few nutrients. There's nitrogen a little bit of potassium and carbon dioxide, sunlight and water. Now in America, the farmers have really gotten to like the idea of being exporters. And they've been fooled into doing that because that's going to make them money. So I showed this number the other day. In 1973, the Soviet Union was a net importer of wheat from the US, with the US being the primary supplier. <laughs> remember those days? Anybody old enough to remember that? where Soviet Union was importing wheat. <clears throat> and then they started to use our technology. We sold them no-till drills, and we sold them fertilizer and all that stuff. We sold them tractors. John Deere shut their tractors off the, one day when, when they, during the war. They, John Deere's don't run anymore. They just shut them off. They, they got all the stuff on them. They shut them off, but other than that, in 2016 and 2017, Russia became the world's number one exporter of wheat, 28 million metric tons of exports. In, in, in the next year, they exported 41 million metric tons. The Ukraine exported 18 million metric tons. That total is more than the total production of wheat in the United States now, of 47 million metric tons. Ruined those guys this whole day. Right? Weeds and disease are ne Mother Nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks diversity. I was scared to death of weeds when I started to no-till. And I was told by our entomologists that I would just, just have insect problems. I just couldn't, I wouldn't be able to spray often enough. I haven't used an insecticide in 19 years. This is the 19th year we have not used a broadcast insecticide. It's all about predators and managing the ecosystem. Weeds are just not a problem. We do use herbicides, but we don't have to use a lot of them because we're smarter than the weeds. We learn to be smarter than the weeds and smarter than the bugs. Adequate diversity is nature's way of 
It, nature's way to add diversity can be uh, countered by adding beneficial diversity to the system. Mother Nature's way to punish you for not having enough diversity is just start sticking insects and weeds in there. Within all texture groups, and the biggest thing is this one, within all texture groups, as organic matter increased from 1% to 3%, the available water holding capacity doubles. When organic matter content reaches 4%, it accounts for 60% of the total available water holding capacity. Now, everybody's really excited about selling their carbon to somebody. I'm not selling my carbon to anybody. I want my carbon for me. Okay? Why do I want to sell the carbon? Because some guy's going to be looking over my shoulder, going, where's my carbon? Prove to me my carbon's there. What did they find? It, what did they say when they left Glasgow a few months ago at this big world meeting? What's going to happen? We're going to increase temperature by 1.5 degrees Celsius. What happens to the soil carbon when you increase the air temperatures by 1.5 degrees Celsius? It's going to gas off. Your organic matter is going to go down. The forest and the rainforest are going to gas off carbon dioxide. The swamps are going to, and the ocean are going to gas off carbon dioxide. Some guy's going to come. Now, 1986, I spent no money on diesel fuel to do tillage. I burned no, no gallons of diesel fuel for tillage. And I haven't burned any gallons of diesel fuels for tillage ever since. That's a permanent offset. I'm never going to burn my 1986 diesel fuel. Right? <laughs> never did that. That's the kind of thing I want to get rewarded for. We need the organic matter. To get the organic matter, we need roots. Everybody understands that. We're going to probably have to use perennial sequences. I don't think I'm going to use a perennial wheat. I'm just going to grow grass and put my cows on it. Okay? That's a good thing. But we should have this deep rooting system. What does Mother Nature do? How does she do things? She makes maximum use of water and nutrients by having webs of mycorrhizal fungi and other tracts, and she uses animals, little ones and big ones, as part of the system. In dry or brittle environments, what we are in the summertime, uh, soil biology slows during the times of low soil moisture. The rumen of the grazing animal keeps that biology going during these times. In cold climates, when I tell you we get down below 20, 20 below Celsius and colder, the soil biology pretty well quits. The rumen of the grazing animal is warm. So it continues during the winter. So one of the things we do that you won't do is after we harvest wheat, we will plant a forage crop, we will swath that forage crop, and then we will graze that during the winter time because we have this cold, dry winter. And that, that hay stays very nice. If we harvest in the fall like that, just leave it out there. And then we use where we have irrigation systems, we'll use them to move the wires. That's one of our best tricks. <laughs> and yeah, that's a good trick anyway. Uh, and you can see they spread the residue and they put the pee out there and they put the poop out there. So the cycle is complete. When I first started working with the Argentines and they would come to visit South Dakota and they'd see all the guys with balers baling hay. And they go, they get to the farm and go, they go, so, Duane, the cows in Dakota have no legs? And I went, oh, okay, got me there. So I had to find a way to, to get my cows to go out and do their own harvesting. The only way to produce human edible protein on marginal land is to use ruminant animals. There's all this talk because we're just going to get rid of meat. We're just going to raise peas and beans and make that into hamburger. 
you can't grow beans and peas on marginal ground. We have some of our land that's like this. You can't drive a four-wheeler on it. It's too steep. You have to have a horse or walk. You can't take a four-wheeler in there. <clears throat> you can't grow anything that's human edible uh, protein there other than use a cow. The perennial grasses do just fine. We need more cows, more sheep, and more goats. The number one meat eaten in the world is goat. Unfortunately, doing all these things is only stopping the bleeding. If we get all this done, we still have just kind of stopped the bleeding. We have more things to do. Climate models estimate the global temperature increased by at least one and a half degrees C. It'll lose carbon. When this happens, soil carbon levels will decline, rainforests and stuff uh, will lose carbon. What happens to your carbon offset? program. I did all this already. We can't do this alone. We need society to buy into this. They have to be willing. And it's more to say, well, I'm going to buy local stuff or whatever. It's deeper than that. They need to support the fact that we all together are responsible for the climate. Ecosystem degradation is a symptom. We talk about ecosystem degradation. It's a symptom. The real cause of that is indifference, greed, jealousy, selfishness, hubris, ignorance. I can go on and on. We got to call a spade a spade. Bureaucracies, governments, corporations are operated by people with limited short term goals. Your MPs up here and whatever, they're, they're just trying to live election to election. Corporate People are not in this for a long time. They're, they're doing one reporting cycle to the next. They make commitments to do environmental things because it, it's greenwashing. It pleases their customers, but they don't have that long term. Farmers, farmers and society, landowners deserve to have long term research and long term goals. Looking forward 600 years, one of the exercises we do with the board is we go through what are we going to be doing, what happens in 600 years if we do this? If we take this tack of research and we start doing this stuff, what, what would that lead to in 600 years? The Native Americans use seven generations as their planning. 280 years is what they use for their planning. In South Dakota, our climate will change. We know that. It's going to get warmer, and we'll probably get drier, but it'll still be a continental climate. We won't have a hot winter. But a bigger impact, if I degrade my soil, if I degrade my soil, it has more of a negative impact than a few degrees difference in Celsius temperature. Doing the right thing environmentally is almost always a correct economic approach in the long run. And you need to tell that to every politician you know. The right thing environmentally is the right answer long term. Take it out a ways and see what happens. I happen to have one, one of the Senate aid guys had been calling me some. And I said, if you do these things, you can forget about all the flood, flood damage you get down in the Gulf of Mexico and those kind of things in the hypoxic zone. We can fix all that by fixing the land. The other day I heard they were talking about all the, the little uh, ravines through here. They get flooded and, and, and damaged and they have to come in and clean them out. If they fixed the water cycle on the land, they wouldn't have those. The best time to make a transformational change, have a, brand, a brain transplant or do a moonshot. Some of you are too young to remember the moonshot, but the Russians were way ahead of us. The U.S. in terms of the space race. We were getting a butts kick. And John Kennedy got elected president. And in his inauguration address, he said, we are, in the, by the end of this decade, we will land a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. He didn't say, I'm gonna, well, we're going to try to change our space program a little bit and whatever. No, he says, we're going to do this. This is what we've got to do with agriculture. The next decade or two, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix the ecosystems. The second best time 
to make a transformational change is now, and we may not get another chance. So take the E out of ET. What E means is evaporation. ET is evapotranspiration, those things together. Evaporation does you no good. It makes you no money. Transpiration, getting the water in the ground, putting it through a plant, allows you to harvest sunlight. If you no-till and you do it any kind of right, low disturbance, all those things, you will harvest more sunlight. There's no doubt about that. We have some good papers uh, that you can read if you go to our website on how to do crop rotations. The other part of taking the E out of ET is to take the T out of can. So, thank you. I don't know if we're doing questions. I'm welcome to do questions, but I call that stump the dummy. <laughs> Hi, that was a really interesting talk, actually. And I'm just wondering, because, you, I mean, you've been farming in America for quite some time, how does the free trade policies that the government introduces, so things like NAFTA, have an impact on local regenerative agriculture? Well, everybody likes the idea of having free trade so they can sell their stuff, but it's not the right thing to do. <laughs> so, you know, like, why, would we, why would we send our nutrients overseas? See, we're, we're, we actually got into this because it was all coming this way. It's all you guys' fault. You were coming up and getting stuff, beaver, and we just got in a habit, but we've got to get out of the habit. And I think trade, to a certain extent, is good. I mean, we don't produce certain things in the U.S. that you can produce elsewhere. And, and so I think there's some of that, but we've just focused everything on trade. And there's so much expense. If you look at the expense of hauling a raw product from the middle of the, the North American continent and getting it all the way to China, it's absolutely insane. You know, better to just put that through pigs and chickens and send them the meat. They've been here for two days and they're tired of this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you mentioned, it. oh, this is so loud, that's terrifying. Um, you mentioned a bit about um, kind of native people in America and obviously we sort of messed that up by colonizing them. Um, is there any like... Yeah, we killed them too with smallpox and that measles. That was quite bad, to be honest. <laughs> um, that wasn't yeah. me, that was the mother... Oh, that's fine. It's probably, it's probably my lot, to be fair. Um, anyway, yeah, is there any sort of, like, um, interest from those communities again in, like, rebuilding, you know, because basically they were doing a kind of regenerative agriculture. Is there a, any interest from those communities in starting that up again? Well, no, the late Native Americans right across the river from me uh, is a... We have a, we have a reservation right across the river from us, and then there's there's one right to the east of us. And they do have farming operations. The, the thing is, is the Sioux tribe, which was there, the last one that was there, actually came from Minnesota. The Arikara and the Hidatsu and, and Mandans and those guys that were there that were the farmers, they died or got pushed out by the Sioux. So, but they do farming. They're not necessarily very good at it. The Navajo in, in uh, Arizona have this farming culture, so they run a big farming operation in, in, uh, in Arizona. The Sioux are better at actually at doing livestock, so they do a lot of stuff with livestock and bison and you know, bison production and that kind of stuff. But yeah, they, they do have tribal lands. They don't have as much as they used to have. Um, the thing that killed most of the Native Americans was disease. There's a, there's a book called um, Guns, Germs, and Steel that talks about why, why that happened, why the Europeans developed guns and germs that didn't, other people couldn't resist and steel, that kind of stuff. It's kind of an interesting book. But yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're doing some of their stuff, a lot of, most, not all, it's, you know, we would normally have one tribal member on the board actually, but um, 
we, you know, it's not like it's a real segregated thing anymore. They have their land and, and they, get, they get their electricity a bit cheaper. That's probably the biggest difference. Another book, if you really, if you want to look at that carbon thing and what happens with temperatures and carbon, uh, it's free on the internet. It's by a guy by the name of Hans Yenny, H-A-N-S, and, and Yenny is J-E-N-N-Y. Um, about 1930s, he wrote a book, uh, uh, Factors of Soil Formation or something, but it's only about 80 pages. It's, it's a great little primer on soil properties. More questions? <laughs> Well, where are your track shoes? So you said about removing the fossil fuels. Um, you're still using, or obviously levels of nitrogen fertilizer and small amounts of herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, what's the plan to get them out of the system or do you see that as a necessary evil? Well, that we're, gonna, we're gonna make our own we're pressing our own fuel. And we may not have a German diesel if I lived where I could get a German uh, SVO engine. Like you can, in Germany, you can buy a straight vegetable oil engine, tractor, but I can't get those there. So I can use my vegetable oils as, as to burn in the tractor or I said neutral I'm going to trade my veggie oil for diesel fuel, or especially for um, the lubricating oils for the for next 15 years, I may not be able to buy lubricating oil. It's biolo biological. Um, the nitrogen fertilizer are, are electric uh, panel system. The excess power from that will go to making nitrogen. And the herbicide levels, what, is, is there a plan to try and eliminate them, or do you see that as a... I don't think we're totally ever going to totally get rid of them, but we're going to offset them. And the, the Haber-Bosch process, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, the reason they use coal or natural gas or whatever to, to make the fertilizer is they need the hydrogen. So they got off the natural gas, but you can hydrolyze water and, and turn it into hydrogen and oxygen and use, uh, use the hydrogen as your, as your source. And, and you can also use hydrogen as a fuel. And there, there is some talk about making hydrogen engines again. But that, I wrote my senior paper and my bachelor's in chemistry on hyd hydrogen engines. So. It's one of those things that's been around a long time and nobody's figured it out, but. Um, but we do have rotations that are gonna be better for, for nitrogen. We're gonna do, we're doing, now that we have the livestock, we're doing more things with alfalfa and stuff and that really does, we think we can get there just uh, on some of the land just with biological. But that's partially why it says research on, this, on the sign. Every, every time my guys say, why the hell are we doing this? I go, it says research on the sign. We, we, have, to, we have to do that. But that's part of what we, we do that because so, we don't, so the farmers don't all have to try things. We're the crazy people. And if it doesn't work, that's part of what we do. But we're going to get there. I mean, the question is, how are you going to get there? It's like no-till. We never, we've never done a tillage comparison study. I put in my first crop rotation study that was all no-till sometime in the mid-80s, and, and we never put a tillage comparison in there. We didn't care, because we've made our mind up. We're not going to do tillage anymore. It's too destructive. Same way with fossil fuels. Yeah, the final question. So um, have you done research on the nutrient density and profile of your on what? Uh, on, on, on your crops, basically, on the, on the output. So, and how that's changed over time with your different practices that you've implemented? 
I'm having trouble with the sorry. mic. Uh, right, yeah, sorry. The, um, this is really loud anyway. But um, yeah, so the nutrient density or the nutrient profile. Oh, nutrient density of a food. How that's changed with the uh, practices. Yeah, it's, um, we're doing a lot of work on phosphorus because we want our phosphorus soil test levels to be low because what a phosphorus soil test measures, Olsen, Bray, Malik, whatever you're using, is the solubility of the phosphorus, not how much is there. And soluble phosphorus is the stuff that moves into waterways or into aquatic ecosystems. So we've drawn our, on all of our farm, the, the solubility of the phosphorus way down. And, and we've done some stuff now with adding more phosphorus to see if that changes, like you talk about nutrient density and stuff. The, the thing we do know is if we haven't added any more phosphorus, use a little bit of starter phosphorus, but we haven't put any bulk stuff on, um, we have six times more mycorrhizal fungi than if we put phosphorus on. So if I got more mycorrhizal fungi, then I probably have more glomalin, I'm gonna have more structure, but I'm also gonna have better uptake of of um, minerals. But you gotta be careful with nutrient density too because we, we have wheat breeders and they come out and they wanna breed high protein wheats. We're gonna have high protein wheats and what happens with the high protein wheats, high protein wheat because it's low yielding. You got a starch metabolism, you got protein metabolism. They occur at the same time and one way to get high protein is to produce less starch your percentage, your percentage of protein is higher, but your total protein that you take up is less too. So there's, there's that, that nutrient density thing gets a little bit crazy sometimes too. But um, we do have, there's a, there's a company called Shepherd's Grain in the Pacific Northwest that uses uh, no-till practices and rotations and things like that, and then kind of sells it to the consumer. And they make flour, goes to artisan bakeries, and also goes to grocery stores and stuff. And they, it was kind of, Carl and I had, I had a long discussion in the bar one night, and that's where Shepherd's Grain grew out of, and he, he developed that, and that's out west. Now he's moving more into the middle part of the country, and he's, you know, we have a, a group called Dakota Lakes Food Producers. That's a, a group, and we're going to kind of tie in with, with Shepherd's Grain a bit. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.